I'm Mark Sector. And I'm Linda Zayas Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Welcome everyone to GM Tools Foreshadowing and Connections, where it was foretold that we would tell you about these topics. Because you guys voted on it two weeks ago. And then I foretold it in every episode since then, in, at the very beginning of the episode. But the question is... But YouTube did not see that foreshadowing. That's true. But the question is, how many people remembered, though we said it every single episode leading up to now, that today's episode would indeed be foreshadowing connections? That's a good question. We should have actually had a vote to see how many people remembered that that was what this episode was. Yeah. Although they might have remembered because I sent like a tweet and a uh, Facebook message just like and then you posted eight it on minutes Pizzo. before com. and posted on Paizo dot com and the and then the um, and then <laughs> and then Leshy bot on the Discord uh, pinged everyone to say what the name of the episode was. Our Discord invite dot gg slash arcane mark invite dot gg slash arcane mark. Oh no! I feel no. like we haven't plugged it during the YouTube section of a video in a while. So maybe not. So come and join us, YouTube. It is a fun and friendly place. That means you can either be the person who joins it and has fun and friends, or that person who joins it makes me wrong just to prove that I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one of those players. All right. So um, we're going to be talking about foreshadowing and, con and connections in games and we sort of actually really have foreshadowed it a little bit from our previous episode where we were talking about recurring characters and themes mm -hmm. because a recurring character is a connection. But it's in the broader sense, foreshadowing and connections are what take your campaign and separate it from um, and make it more like a TV series and less like something that's fully monster of the week. There's no connection other than the player characters which admittedly is a connection like that mm -hmm. could be your connection but you could have something that's even less connected than that like one of our friends at college his favorite thing to do is just a different one shot every week that's what he would have rather done than a um a campaign mm -hmm. uh of course he didn't realize or maybe he did that like that takes a ton of effort on the gm's part if it's a one shot where the gm provides pre-gens that are mm -hmm. hooked in and etc but he would have been happy without any foreshadowing connections between sessions. You could also have foreshadowing within sessions. Even some of those one-shots we played definitely had foreshadowing and payoff in them. So this is a topic that almost no matter what you're doing, they're going to come up. Um, less so for if you're uh, running a uh, organized play adventures, you might not need it as much because of the fact that you might not literally go. You might not literally know what the foreshadowing is because, in order to keep really cool secrets a secret from um, that is not spoiled by saying, "Oh, now I'll run that one because it was really cool." Oh, it's in the GM summary. Sometimes in organized play, some of the secrets that are foreshadowed in the adventure are not even actually mentioned to, to the be GM. Fair, actually, more often than more often than we know exactly where this is going, and we're just not going to tell you yet. Well, we certainly do have that for the season arc where we That's know where things are going. About. We're not going to tell you. The but, there's also, but there's also a lot of cases where we'll drop characters that we intend to pick up later, and we have some ideas of how we're going to use them again. But we don't have to know how we're going to use the game again in order to drop them and have them be foreshadowing. And I think that's a really important point for, for your games, too. Yes. That you don't have to know exactly how everything's going to pan out before you start dropping foreshadowing. There's the so many different foreshadowing structures. What Linda is sort of getting at there is the foreshadow um, structure of sort of like sprinkle down a minefield of foreshadowing and then whatever they step on um and the players actually mm -hmm. remember pick up on oh my gosh that's the one that i mean happened. we will we do that exactly through uh an organized play we do that through collecting reporting data and in your own campaign you can easily do that from just what leads do people pick up mm -hmm. and you know you can definitely have foreshadowing even if you know where this thing is roughly going and the pcs don't go anywhere near that you can definitely have something that foreshadows some big event that takes place in another nation and the PCs don't pick up on that. You know, the big event in the other nation still happens and that changes things in the world. And it's like, oh, yeah, that changed because of this thing. And you can you can put that together for them. But 
just because you have foreshadowing in a game doesn't mean you always have to know exactly where it's going or have an exact plan for the, that you're definitely going to follow up on. That is that is very true, as it is in many of our other episodes about um, you can sort of play it connectively. But where I was getting at is mm-hmm. in organized play, also in an adventure in adventure path, less so because that first volume is going to give you the summary at the back. Mm-hmm. Um, even then, there's some things you're not going to be able to foreshadow completely correctly if you don't um, wait for all six volumes before you start. Um, but in organized play, when you're playing the season adventures as Hi, they Alex. come along, um, and um, you're not going to actually be able to foreshadow everything that happens towards the end. Even if um, Linda and Mike and James and Thirsty did foreshadow it in mm-hmm. the adventure, but they foreshadowed it in a way such that even the GM was being foreshadowed, which means that the GM probably can't necessarily use the tools from this episode to try to make sure the players notice the thing. But, I mean, just present what it shows in the scenario. Yeah. When we, because if we have foreshadowing in there, we're going to make it be more prominent. Like have that character have a speaking role in a picture yep. or other things going on. So yes, um, but other tools we're going to talk about about like sort of um, gauging and sort of moving towards things and be like, oh, it doesn't seem like they pick this up. You change mm-hmm. the way you present it. You you can't do that there. You can do it anywhere else, mm-hmm. even if it's a published adventure. And you can do it within a scenario about foreshadowing for later in that scenario. Just not the connections that mm-hmm. we're mostly going to be talking about, which are foreshadowing that goes beyond the session. So, actually, since it's applicable to Pathfinder Society 2, um, let's talk about very short-term foreshadowing first. Yeah. This is foreshadowing that is paid off um, sometimes almost right away, like where you see all of these like statues and then there's a basilisk. Mm-hmm. Um, very short-term foreshadowing is one of the types of foreshadowing that you won't need some of our more advanced tips for because it's one of the few types of foreshadowing that most people can just easily pick, who are not foreshadowing junkies, can just, like me, can just easily pick up on mm-hmm. short-term foreshadowing, or even if they don't pick up on it, they'll remember it when it's like, oh, it's a basilisk, that's why there were statues. So when you're thinking about short-term foreshadowing, it's good to think about where has whatever the threat is, where has it been recently, and what has it been doing, and what signs may it have left behind, and are there some signs, and can you make there be more obvious signs if, because there's you still have a lot of choice in what has it been doing recently. So, for example, with the basilisk, having something be there that it has petrified recently, or this is where you get into the uh, the the much maligned. Um, Diary of All My Secret Information is uh, one of the ways that that authors often do this is have someone write down what they've been up to. But there's other ways to get across that same idea that are less um, less direct, like having NPCs that the PCs are very likely to speak with that give that information. Or even when you're when you're into a situation where the PCs speak with someone they weren't as likely to speak with, there's an encounter that you expected to be a combat, but the PCs accepted their surrender and then they start to talk. And then they have this conversation, and then that person gives that information. So um, I would say that there's there's environmental cues, like things about the area that are different than you might expect. So that might be claw marks in the ground or, or scorch marks or other things like that that help to indicate how that creature fights or some of those more esoteric things like a petrified creature for a basilisk. There's information that's left behind in the form of notes or magical misses or things like that that's more static. <sighs> <laughs> and then there's uh, the more dynamic information in the sense of conversations that the PCs can have with with NPCs that are that are right near. And, and I'm going to talk about notes more in the long term foreshadowing because they are used poorly even in published adventures for long term foreshadowing mm-hmm. out of a sort of a desperation. And I'm not saying I have an answer that would replace the desperation of using them, but they really. Are, are can get to a point of oddity in mm-hmm. a lot of people's campaigns. And I'm not saying I'm not guilty of this, mm-hmm. too. Well, that's why I call it the much maligned note, because it is one of those things that can really pull people out of the campaign by shattering the fourth wall and being like, why would they write the note about their secret plan? So I think it's going to be good for us to talk about what are, our, what are some good alternatives to the note yes. when we get to that point. But these are the things I see as the short-term foreshadowing, the you're in the dungeon, you're in the city, you're in the place where this this um 
whatever it is that you're encountering is, how do you, what kinds of ways can you convey information? And some other benefits of short-term foreshadowing is even if they don't figure out exactly what's there, mm-hmm. if it's something that's burning all around, they might be able to put up some fire protection. Mm-hmm. So PCs can react to short-term foreshadowing even if they can't like completely figure out what's going on with the short-term foreshadowing. And um, it's relatively easy to apply compared to Mm -hmm. an actual connection between sessions or a long-term foreshadowing and you probably don't have to worry too much about adjusting it like they either get it or they don't Mm -hmm. and they will still remember it even if they didn't figure it out most likely Mm -hmm. and connect it back in a lot of cases with the short-term foreshadowing i like to set it up with uh sort of two levels of information there's a level of information that's really blatant on the surface so for example these are look like they're living statues or whatever but or this room is burned out or you know there's some encrypted notes here or you know this person is really afraid of something and they're muttering about like claws and teeth and then there's the and then there's the second layer where the pcs can make a skill check to learn more information so they might learn like oh this fire came from an alchemical source so you can expect that it's probably like some kind of alchemist you might decipher the notes you might calm this person down enough to tell you that it's a dragon is the to describe so you can tell it's a dragon that's the cause of the claws and teeth or or what have you with with the identification so i think that's a good way to go about it so that there's that clue that they always get no matter what but it doesn't feel quite so much handed to them and they can they can try to figure out more and that also encourages players to engage more with the clues that you give if you give them the sense that if they investigate when you say something they might find out something more that's more useful to them yep and when it comes to getting small clues and investigating, uh, Pathfinder 2nd Edition has an investigate exploration tactic that is pretty handy. And, of course, the investigator playtest class that just sort of gets those small clues automatically makes it kind of easy mm-hmm. to dump those clues to the player. In fact, in some ways, it, that itself can provide a way to, um, to avoid those notes. But the notes are more often used for long-term connective tissue, so we'll, we'll save off for there. Oh, thanks, Owen. Thanks, Owen. I mean, they are, um, Linda's is only newish, but they are new based on um, when Owen left the company. That's true, rest, that's right? true. So, well, I mean, I, I got the title, I got the title at Gen Con. Yep. I had a very public announcement of my title. We, uh, we miss you, Owen. Yeah. <laughs> Let us know if you're ever in the area and coming back to visit. We want to hang out. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, um, it is it's nice to be the design manager, and I have, uh, I guess I didn't tell this to YouTube, and YouTube, you may not have seen it anywhere else. So um, I am the design manager. Paizo, you may have seen it on nameplates, starting with the December episode of Paizo Friday, where... Um, Logan and I were talking about the, um, the play test and, uh, basically that means that I am going to sort of be working on the cons- design consistency across all the various products and games, departmental outreach, the design process, including freelancers and things like that. All right. So, uh, where were we? Um, um, we, we had talked about short-term foreshadowing, but now we were going to get into... The um, investi- the, you had just been talking about the, the investigator, investigator class working. and the and the investigate. Yes, that's right. In second edition. So before we get into long-term, really long-term foreshadowing that can be even beyond a connection that, mm-hmm. and be like, this is something that will be picked up way later, let's talk about uh, the different types of connections. Because short-term foreshadowing is so short that... It comes before connections too, but connections mm-hmm. are sort of what makes your campaign into something that is more than, like we said at the beginning, more than just a series of completely unrelated one shots. Even Pathfinder Society, which is famed for its ability to plug and play uh, whenever you want in whatever order, has some really neat connections with story arcs that um, go throughout the seasons and between the seasons as mm-hmm. well. So. One of the obvious connections is your player characters, unless you're switching the characters each time. And th- those are a connection that sort of, they every connection that you make implies constraints. 
and constraints can breed creativity. In the case of the constraints of the player characters, you have two constraints, which are the constraint of their um, coherent narrative of moving forward and onward to new adventures um, with the experiences that they've left behind of the previous adventures. They, that can get a little rocky in Pathfinder Society when they literally go back in time in certain mm -hmm. earlier adventures. But in most campaigns, uh, especially if it's a home campaign, you can just do whatever you want. Um, you can just sort of use those connections to strengthen the role playing by helping to tell a story of the character's evolution. And we talked about this in uh, the previous episode about building an engaging character. But um, just to reiterate quickly, real people change when the people they love and the people they care about and the people they trust talk to them about um, like big, even big topics that they have a strong belief on. They, they might not completely flip-flop mm -hmm. to the other side, but they change their perspective. And real people are influenced by their experiences. Yes. And therefore... It's actually, people sometimes say, this is unrealistic if I just have my character change this and fit in more with the party. But it actually is a more of a realistic person if your character uh, winds up with an arc. Not just because you said at the beginning, oh, my character is really gloomy and will learn to be more optimistic. Mm -hmm. Before meeting any of the other players, you just decided, that's my arc, I'm going to do it no matter what. Mm -hmm. But more so... If you just but then the GM ran a Cthulhu horror game. Oh no! He somehow became more optimistic uh, anyway. But more so, if you're connected to everyone else and you're connected to the narrative, and you tell an arc in that way. So mm -hmm. one of the connections the PCs bring is their own narrative arc. The other one they bring mathematically in Pathfinder, at least in Starfinder, and a lot of other similar games, is they bring the connection of well, if it's going to be the same PC each time, they're going to be leveling up. So the story is going to have to get higher stakes, at least in terms of what you're facing as enemies. And it probably should get higher stakes in terms of literal stakes, because it's a little weird if it's like if it starts out as like, oh, we're in a caravan bringing goods, and we're being attacked by goblins. And now at the end, oh, we're still in that caravan mm -hmm. bringing the same goods, but pit fiends are attacking our wagons. And by the same token, it's weird if you have super low-level characters doing super high-stakes stuff when there's high-level characters around that would more logically be asked to do that. Both for that for that verisimilitude issue and the fact that if you start off if you start off adventuring on the moon, then where do you even go from there? With apologies. Oh, there's 20th level Sun Orchid Elixir. Who can be a good test of what 20th level people will try to steal the elixir? First level in Pathfinder Society. Yes, character. I've often given the Sun Orchid Steel <laughs> as an example in Pathfinder Society of what not to do. Uh, we were we ran into a situation where we had too many one to fives, and we had that we had in the season for the stories we had, and so we held our noses and tried to tell a version of that for one to five as an alternative to not being able to tell that story at all. But when you have that control in your own game, like it's really good to make sure that you're um, that the that. There's sort of a sense of level bands, the low level, the mid level, the sort of the mid to high level, and then those super high levels, and they each have their own types of things that that you should do. I mean, Dennis, I like that scenario too. It's an amazing it's a adventure. It's fun scenario. It's just it's, it just happens. And it's it's this one is of the best. It's it, one of the best heist scenarios that Pathfinder Society ever published. But the premise makes no sense. It's an example of a failure of matching stakes to level. Right. But that doesn't mean it's not still a fun scenario. It's great. And if the author's watching, you did a very good job. Yes. But the outline that you were given did not make very much sense because yes. it was a high-level threat. And the fact that the PCs even were able to debug the threat means that that they were nowhere near protected enough for the Sun Orchid. Mm -hmm. No wonder the Espus Consortium steals like so much Sun Orchid elixir from them. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then we needed to make a plot point about like why were there such low level people doing this? And mm -hmm. I don't know if we if we really stuck that landing. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's a that's a that's a different story. Yes, but that is part of the question of the connections that imply the story. Of if the even if the connection is just the PCs mm -hmm. and you're just running whatever you want, and it's completely different, or a sandbox. Mm -hmm. Well, you bring up the Aspis Consortium, and that makes me think of another um, another major thing about connections is having organizations that are consistent allies or threats. Right. And these and, Recurring characters yeah, from our last... Well, yes, but I mean, I think that um, this can either be um, the overt organization that's like, ah, oh, yes, this is the organization we're continuing to fight, 
or with um, with more subtle foreshadowing connections, it could be that there are a lot of people who are affiliated with a particular organization, mm-hmm. and you don't know up front, ah, yes, this is the Aspis Consortium, their headquarters is here, and this is what their deal is. But you have an organization that's somewhat shadowy, or you have people who are hired to work as mercenaries for an organization, and you just start to see clues and don't know, uh, and don't know to start with. Because the idea of foreshadowing of a larger organization or of a larger mission or goal or objective is one of the most common that you'll see is oh all these many plots fit together into this one larger plot right so uh the the idea of organizations and characters that are recurring go um it's still up on twitch if you're watching Mm -hmm. this on twitch um by the time you're watching this on youtube it'll be up on youtube Go watch that episode. We're not going to go into huge detail about how to do it, but the point is that a um, a recurring character is a great way to connect things. Recurring organizations where the enemy or ally or neutral characters that work together is a great way to make the world feel... That one makes the world feel real, and it's like, oh yeah, this organization is all stomping around this place. Mm-hmm. And recurring characters is another thing that Pathfinder Society does, even if you play out of order, because... Everyone is. Everyone remembers Drendel Drang and mm-hmm. how he wakes you up in the middle of the night, and he seems like he might not know what is going on. But then you find out, like he was a Talden spy, and he's actually. Uh, oh, you play. Yeah, you play School of Spirits. School of Spirits. And he's it's wearing like, both an Eagle Might medal and a medal from the Talden from the Line Blades, the yes. Secret of Talden Spies. And it's like, how did you get those medals? Or like, even as early as Year of the Shadow Lodge, yeah. he's just stumbling around, and then he pulls out, like, a sword cane or something, and just yeah. is, like, fighting back these giant dragons. Mm-hmm. Um, like, he's an interesting recurring character that has different depth that you can learn depending on what you play, but you also just remember him easily because of his shtick of waking you up in the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. Um so, in an ongoing campaign, it's even easier to insert recurring characters, and we'll leave that, uh, we'll leave you to that episode to learn more about how to do that. Um, but there are other connections, too, that you can make that go in between organizations, the PCs, NPCs. There are connections such as, um... Items, objects, uh, yes, locations. items and objects. Uh, sets of items. It's like, oh, well... I talked about in my Jade Regent how I created a full set of items that, um, there's one that you get that's related to the PCs, a really cool katana, um, mm-hmm. but one of the five Imperial families of Minkai had, so I created a set of those that could be an additional amount of continuity. And, there. um, in Rise of the Rune Lords, the Sahadron Medallions, who is origi- who's, who's, Original purpose isn't revealed until the sixth part, but that you find a lot of them throughout the adventure path. Or in Shattered Star, the seven parts of the Sahedron. The seven parts of the Sahedron, yeah. So, items can be, themes can be, go watch the episode on themes to find out more about how a unifying theme, even if all the details are different, can Mm -hmm. sort of make something feel connective. Almost anything. You can have leap motifs where you literally play certain parts of music um, at, at certain moments. Star Wars certainly does that and mm-hmm. gets some really good connections. So um, you can use almost anything for connections, but think about the connections in your campaign because they can strengthen your campaign. And um, foreshadowing can be part of what connects things. Let's get into some of the longer-term foreshadowing. Because connections also aren't necessarily that hard to do. And when it's not supposed to be foreshadowing, you can just tell people if they don't know. Mm-hmm. Be like, this guy's from the Aspis Consortium. What's that? Well, remember that other or- evil organization that that other guy was from mm-hmm. who you fought back then? Oh, yeah, that person was from the Aspis Consortium. You can just flat out tell them. Mm-hmm. When it comes to foreshadowing, it's a little trickier than that. Character, well, th- this one of the things is we, that we also talked about in recurring characters is the idea of having your your ultimate villain or some kind of powerful character appear in a context where the PCs really can't punch them out, but where they get the chance to see them, whether they have any reason to believe that they're a threat at that time or not. Right. So, you know, they might, you might meet them at a party when they're 13th level and you're first level and you don't yet know that they're going to be a villain and you talk to them and they seem calculating and strategic and like possibly their objectives might go counter to yours but you're not going to go punch them out of the middle of a party or right might... war for the crown part one starts with a party it does not have like the ultimate final yeah. fight in the party but it has several people that you later have to deal with are in that mm-hmm. party 
And if you did try to punch them out, that would be really bad. And it would make no sense yet in the context of the plot. But it does let you meet those characters. So I'd say, like, um, parties, galas, meetings, conferences, convocations, and other social events are great places to introduce powerful characters that you wouldn't necessarily want to have them punch yet. Trials, um... They, they can be they can appear in pretty much any context that has that defined okay yes but if you attack them here then it would be a problem or why would you attack them they're just such and such a person I'm going to get into another kind of long term um, foreshadowing now that has mm-hmm. interesting possibilities but it has some it has multiple types of drawbacks to the point that it is um, a type of foreshadowing that James Jacobs dislikes so much that we have an age of lost them in um, in Pathfinder where they don't yes. work, which is divinations, omens, uh, lost omens, mm-hmm. um, and prophecies. Those can in books, um, prophecies can be really amazing foreshadowing TV shows and movies, and they can be in your game, but they have um, they have sort of two things that really go against them. One mm-hmm. is um, an overall theme that we mentioned in recurring characters and might as well mention here, which is if your foreshadowing isn't paid off like immediately, your players, for almost all players, will just forget that you said it or just not be able to connect it. Mm-hmm. So, um, and David says, you mean that prophecies work well when one person has total control? That's the other side of it, which mm-hmm. is that even if you're a GM like me, where I can run a sandbox and have for, um, like, the first campaign Linda played, I can run a sandbox where I have 90% or higher fidelity towards my guesses of what mm-hmm. the players will do. And they always surprise me at how they do it, but they don't surprise me in what they do almost ever. So in Kingmaker... But even then, even then, um, that's a good case scenario. Mm-hmm. But so in Kingmaker, I had a prophecy type thing, but it, that I added, but that was coming from uh, Matt the Three, who is sort of seeing possible weaves of fate. And instead of having a like a prophecy that was like, ah, yes, and then you will do this, and then you will do this, it was just sort of telling the wizard's player, hey, go find this person, which was the uh, the bard the bard character. This person's going to be important to the future of these lands or whatever. It was, so it wasn't it, like it was presented kind yeah. of like a prophecy, but it wasn't yeah. that this will happen. That was just the one she wanted to happen. It's the one that she wanted to happen, yeah. So, and she knew that it might not happen. And it was, if and, she it was didn't also, and it was also like it was also essentially a prophecy that the PCs would at some point have to deal with the final boss of the campaign and have a chance to change the world. So like it wasn't, oh yes, and this exactly will happen in this exact way. So I'd say that if you're going to deal with prophecy, then having things that are more open-ended and are much more like, you will be the one who decides this important thing, or you have a, these people have a grand destiny. Like, it doesn't say exactly what Yeah, you don't be. want it to be as explicit, probably, unless you're sure that you're just going to do this in a novel as something like, the Lord of Murder shall perish, and in his death shall leave a score of mortal progeny. So saith the wise Alonzo. Like, you can do that at the beginning of Baldur's Gate, because mm-hmm. he, the Lord of Murder is already dead in a novel. Um, mm-hmm. And so you don't have to deal with player agency. Um, yeah. but, but because that's very direct at, of what will happen. And mm-hmm. Linda is not really into the Forgotten Realms. I think you can tell what that prophecy was saying. And yeah. it, it is exactly what you think it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it makes sense, too. I mean, I think about, too, like, the, the also the idea of prophecies that have a lot of possible interpretations is a way to go about it. So that... You, if you can see, like, there's three ways the campaign might go, and this could be interpreted in a different way based on how each of them are. Or or the idea that prophecy can be unreliable, or, like, one of these prophecies will hold true, or something or something like that. Like, I think about, uh, it's like the Hall of Prophecies, one of these will be true, and you don't know, like, who's the true prophet, and, and that, could be, that could be undecided, or maybe the PCs are have this role of shapers of fate who help to decide which prophecies are going to come to pass. But the point is, the point is, um, whatever you do with prophecies, avoid very specific direct things that prescribe exactly what the PCs are going to do. So we interjected in the middle of where I was saying the best case scenario is mm-hmm. a GM who actually is um, predictive enough to know mo- almost all of what their players are going to do. But here's the problem mm-hmm. still, is that that prophecy that they heard 
and then that completely, let's say it completely predicted what they did. And they had a full choice, but mm-hmm. it was just right. Oh, I like it Owen's ma- idea it, here. Um, but before we go to it, I've been in the middle of saying it multiple times, so let's finish this yeah. Let's finish this thought, which is it makes the players feel disenfranchised, even though they were fully enfranchised. The fact that you predicted them also may make it seem like you railroaded them, even if you didn't. Mm-hmm. And so even in the best case scenario, it can feel bad. Now let's look at the really cool stuff that's uh, in prophecies here. Prophecies that are specific that talk about what happens if the villain wins. Like, should the Green Lord slay you all, no one else can stop his conquest of the world. Because if there's a TPK, the prophecy doesn't matter much anymore. Yes, if thens in prophecies can definitely definitely work. They show branching possibilities, like the one that Linda gave us from Mac the Three, the eldest, um, mm-hmm. that sort of was presented not to look like it was branching, but it was branching. And when it's mm-hmm. branching, that makes it feel like there are choices. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, David says there's a downside of there are multiple possible choices. You're going to choose the wrong one no matter which one you chose. Um, that can be a possibility as well. That th- There's there's a lot of reason that James did not want um, Golarian to have mm-hmm. prophecies because you have to use them well. Um, I happen to like divinations, and we still have short-term divinations, like the one-week divination spell. I like giving, like, vague, um, poems that people come back to, and they're like, oh, yeah. And I've even, um, done that, um, successfully in Pathfinder Society scenarios, where you can't do very much, so, um, there was, when was the last time I did that? I guess there was, it was the Cleric of Kijong and one of the dwarven trilogy like Mm -hmm. um did a divination and i just wrote down some stuff that basically was it was a random sonnet that was just about the theme of the scenario but it had like wordplay or allusions to all the encounters in order in a way that you they sort of guessed one of them kind of but Mm -hmm. then after each one the player who still had the sheet in front of him was like oh that's that thing yeah he's always able oh right that encounter it was what they were talking about in line Mm -hmm. three yeah. And um, that seemed to work out, um, That in part because the Pathfinder Society scenarios are usually more railroaded. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, it was a dungeon that they had to approach in a particular way, so it felt reasonable that Kijong would tell them about the threats they might face like along each of those, along that path that, yeah. that they knew they were going to take. Um, when you go long, that's short term though. Again, when you go long term, it can get dicey. The other part is players are going to forget it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just will not remember. We talked about it in recurring characters last um, that time, but there there was some random foreshadowing that I threw um, to Linda in a ga- campaign I'm running for her multiple years ago in real life. But mm-hmm. then she went to her notes at one point. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this was in the foreshadowing. I know who this person is now, but yeah. she did not know who it was. An uh, advantage of taking notes and then going back through your notes through the campaign and finding it. Uh, another one that you can do is if there's some kind of like in a, some kind of world-shaking event that's going to happen in the future in a way that's not necessarily tied to directly what the PCs are doing, like the return of some great bad villain or... The, some form of cosmic alignment that's going to happen and something that the PCs are preparing for and building toward or some kind of a change or transformation that's going to happen. Not something that's going to destroy everything that, that, that they're doing, of course not, but something that they may be able to react to because they know about. Owen has another one here. He views ones that seem specific that aren't. Should the black door be broken, a tetramarch will rise again. If no one really breaks anything that's like a black door, I just had the villain... Using not be the tetramark even if it uses the same stat block. The PCs were clever about avoiding the prophecy and give them some kind of advantage, like gain the tetramark's blade that makes their eventual end villain weaker. It does help if you know whether or not your group has the one player who writes down everything and checks their notes regularly. And Alex Aguna suggests prophecies like in Harry Potter where you don't find out about the prophecy until it's obvious that it is going to happen and mm-hmm. it doesn't really say what the outcome will be. Yeah. That's another way, that's certainly another way to go about it. Where it's like, oh yeah, this is this that, is this thing. That, that one is yeah. prophecy as explanation for the action of NPCs rather than prophecy as foreshadowing, no mm-hmm. necessarily. But um, we, I mean, that's totally reasonable. We've gotten yeah. into the point where we're talking about the narrative device of prophecy, yes, not just in the context of foreshadowing. And there are many ways to use them. And um, <laughs> well, this book of prophecy would have been really useful a month ago. It all <laughs> happened now. <laughs> yep, and. So, 
the um, the problem that you have and that the, the sort of the law I've talked about the quote this guy's law I'm not going to say the name of um, one of our players randomly on on mm -hmm. the show from college but he mm -hmm. made a he called it his last name's law which was that your players won't remember anything that you try to give as foreshadowing unless you not only directly state it but do so multiple times and mm -hmm. it's ten times as obvious as you think is directly telling them they'll have forgotten. And unless you have, is, a, but unless you have a player that I was that player for this group, th who will pick up anything, even if you give only one tenth of an inkling of the information. If they're regularly speculating aloud about your foreshadowing, then they've got it. Otherwise, they probably forgot. Yep, that that is true. Unless you see it come, unless you have a comeback multiple times, and then they're like, "Oh yeah, it's this thing again. Oh yeah, we saw that symbol before." When it comes to interpreting prophecies, there's no one more so than someone who at a young age was reading the Wheel of Time and trying to figure out what the <laughs> heck, what the heck was going on or would happen in later books. Mm -hmm. Towards being like, "Oh well, this prophecy is less opaque." Yep. <laughs> And that would be that would be me for for my group, and there's other people like that in some other groups. So you need to gauge your group, which we say that kind of all the time. Players might also not be um, self aware enough to know if they're the person who always picks up foreshadowing. So even a session zero can't necessarily help you, mm -hmm. but you can see if there's if you sprinkle foreshadowing and it's just whoosh. drop some me drop some short to medium term foreshadowing early on and see how they respond. If they don't pick it up at all, then you'll need to step up your foreshadowing game for anything you want in the long term. Yep. Like, the, we'll need to get to the point where, that Shark Shasa has appeared where we talked about this story where mm -hmm. there's a mystery in town of what's going on, and there's a sign that says, there are Rakshasas here, and in the inn, there's a person, and you say, his hand is backwards, and mm -hmm. he says, pleasure to eat, I mean me to you, <laughs> and roars like a tiger in anger, and um, he, he, and his name is Rock. Shasa, mm -hmm. and then the players say, I know who killed all those people. It was sharks, and that's how yeah. shark shasas came to be. Yes. But sometimes that will happen, and you need to know your group. Yep. Well, I mentioned symbols. Symbols are another great connective device. Mm -hmm. If it, a symbol that's associated with an organization or an event that keeps cropping up over and over again, and then you can keep describing the symbol in exactly the same way. So... Um, that, that's, uh, describing it exactly the same way is something that's useful, too. If you use somewhat of an eclectic turn of phrase that you always use exactly that same phrase for the same thing every single time, then people might start to pick up on it. Yep. And also, you might not know what the symbol is first. You yeah. might just leave the symbol. Yeah. There are things where we talked about the sort of minefield approach of leave lots of foreshadowing, whatever the PCs pick up on. That becomes the foreshadowing that that becomes mm -hmm. important. You can just leave a symbol and not be sure what it is, or talk about like Owen said a tetra mark, and not mm -hmm. you don't have to be sure what that is. Like you know, if you keep finding equipment and the equipment always the equipment always has uh, engraving, it has engravings of obsidian engravings with inlaid obsidian claws in them, and then you keep keeping this description of great engravings with inlaid obsidian claws over and over again then you might start to think, hey, you know, what's up with these engravings with inlaid obsidian claws? Owen says he loves the minefield approach, and I like it too because it sort of is, it's also a bit of a Rorschach test for your players mm -hmm. as to what they actually are interested enough in to yeah. remember, and you learn a lot about what the players want by the minefield approach, so you can give them the one that they actually thought was cool. Owen also suggests you can sometimes have the PCs beat the prophecy and all the soothsayers and oracles are like... How did that happen? To mm -hmm. give them an extra sense of agency. That's somewhat what the Age of Lost Omens lets you do because it's not that every prophecy ever made in the Age of Lost Omens mm -hmm. is always wrong. It's that there's not much point in it when it can be wrong. Yeah. And, um, uh, Alex... It reminds me of, uh, like, Contact Other Plane, how it's not really a worthwhile spell because there's a decent chance that they'll just lie to you. So, why would and you And the think? chance that they lie to you is very high. Yeah. It's not... Uh, um, of course, the worst would be if it was 50-50, which I think yeah. one of the planes is, is a 50-50 if they give you an answer yeah. at all, which is just like, why would you do this? We were but, talking about how that could be, like, a zero-level spell where it's like, oh, we'll just flip a coin and see what happens. That's right. <laughs> um, so, so uh, <laughs> that's the god, David. That's the god of truth. They the lie. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> so Alex says that James Ballad from No Direction is the best with foreshadowing because he remembers stuff that Alex says when it happens. He's either like ah, just like they said, or oh my gosh, the things we were warned about happened. Why were we so dumb? 
Uh, yes, it's it can it can be very gratifying if you're a foreshad a GM who likes to do foreshadowing to have the player who is remembering it, and um, it can be good. Um, having been the player, I can tell mm-hmm. you from GMs, it can usually be good. It can sometimes be a problem when they're trying to be sort of sneaky about it, and then you immediately pick up on it. And then there's my weird situation where I sometimes will pick up on non-foreshadowing but be correct or barely foreshadowing and be correct Mm -hmm. that I don't really know what to do about that. whenever you're putting foreshadowing in, it's like we mentioned recurring characters. Unless there is some really, really strong reason why the PCs can't just attack slash do the thing right now. Like, they are at a party, they have no reason to believe this 13th, you're the first level, they have no reason to believe this 13th level character is an enemy and they all know that if they attack this character then the guards are going to take them and capture them and possibly kill them. Like, you have to be ready for the PCs to run with that and to have more clues and to to jump into situations. And um, I, I guess the, the main thing here to keep in mind is that you may have PCs jumping in and getting in over their head with these sorts of situations. So, being ready for that and having ways to signify to them that they're in over their head without completely destroying them. Like, the PCs go to assault the fortress. They're captured by the guards at the front gate and imprisoned. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, one of their allies, one of their allies bails them out, but then they owe that ally a favor based on that. And now they know they can't just go assault the fortress and they're, and they're banned from that nearby city, so they're going to have to use disguises when they go in and attack the next time. Right. So there's a consequence, but they don't all TBK. Yeah. Owen mentions using the minefield for background or cultural notes, like a guard with a fork in his tall cloth hat, and the PCs might get excited about that. And then that's when Owen decides to to decide that those guards work to prevent starvation. That's why the fork is in there. Um, that definitely um, plays towards something that um, Owen has almost certainly also um, read, and I might get the number on it wrong, but... Um, one of the articles that I read when I was very young in Dungeon Magazine was about Dungeon Craft, and, like, the zeroth rule was just don't design a thing that you don't need. Just make just enough, and then when you find out what the PCs want, then, uh, then that's when you design the rest. Don't, like, create a city with every single inhabitant in it and all of the shops that are, like, 500 There's shops. There's only one thing you can guarantee if you make a city that detailed. The PCs aren't going to even go there. The they'll they'll aren't leave right away. There, and they're not going to spend any yeah. time there. They're not going to care about any of the scenes you drop. And they might, but it's yeah. still a waste of your time. And the minefield approach lets you sort of narratively fill in just the right amounts based on the make the world deep where the PCs care that it's deep. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's important in foreshadowing. And that's important shallow, but, in the whole but, game. But Owen's talking about here, flavorful, because it has these these fun little details. And those sorts of fun little details, I mean, the guard by the keep door has a tall cloth hat, but if the PCs never went to the keep, that could well be the guard by the gatehouse that has a tall cloth sure. hat. Sure. Or so it could be something that you didn't pre-plan, like, but just yeah. you decide you to decide say he has the, a fork in the, the hat. Yeah. And then they get really excited, then it's the Order of Guards who prevents starvation. Yeah. So, um, you could just toss something random that's in your head, and Mm -hmm. then later justify it in most cases. And you also don't have to be ready to justify the random ideas you come up with in that session. Um, This is a perfect use of time between sessions to come up with something else to explain how your new additions all fold into the story and where they might lead. And while we're in, while we're on the topic of really random minefield, I want to go into one type of foreshadowing that, um, actually, it looks like Owen has a response to what we were saying there. If you, if you have a cool minor detail, you can drop it where the yes. pieces go. Right. Um, and other than he was saying, write down where you put your details. If yes. you have this more scattershot approach, recording what information you've used from your bank of ideas, where, because I mean... What information you've used from the bank of ideas, especially for me, God, names, recording what names I've used and which NPCs, that's the hardest. So here's the flip side to the scattershot approach. Sometimes you could get foreshadowing that helps you by mistake. And you need to be able to run with that too. Um, To give another example, even though my GM was not able to um, pull it off, but could have, it's one that you guys may have heard from our previous episodes. Mm -hmm. Um, I GM'd almost exclusively when I started off, but one of my few PCs that I played was in a Shackled Cities game. Mm -hmm. And as it started off, my character wanted to go to the Blue Crater Academy. And turns out that was through the front door of where I came from, Sasserine to Cauldron. Turn left, and it's there. You almost can see it. It's a block away. Mm -hmm. 
but the adventure calls for an ambush that is um, turn right and go through like 12 different turns mm -hmm. to a back alley full of thieves guild made of um, made up of disaffected guards who weren't paid enough. Mm -hmm. And all the PCs are ambushed there, and that's how they get together. Yeah. While the front gate guard, Bob the guard, um, mm -hmm. who was a throwaway character that the GM made, I was meeting with him and doing a little role play as I made it to the town. Some mm -hmm. people were from the town. I was not. And I asked to go to the Blue Crater Academy. He gave me directions that went... Uh, the town, by the way, is in the Cauldron of Volcano. It's sort of... So it's donut-shaped around the, um, the crater. So you either go right or you go left. Mm -hmm. And he sent me in that terrible path that led into an alley so where I was like really short to go there that way, otherwise, yeah. like you do this. You have to go the all the way around the donut. Yeah, yeah. 200 or, or more than 290 degrees, like over yeah. 300 degrees around the whole thing, mm -hmm. and into a back alley that I didn't need to take. Yeah. Um, and I got ambushed by this thieves guild that we later found out was made up of guards. Mm -hmm. Well, my character decided that Bob the guard was a, a member of the Last Laugh Thieves Guild, mm -hmm. or at least an informant for them who would send people who looked like they were wealthy-ish, or because being a scholar, I might have been wealthy even though I wasn't, mm -hmm. and into ambushes um, if they were naive and didn't know their way around town. Mm -hmm. um, that was not what the GM had planned, and he didn't follow up on it, even as I kept asking the guard mm -hmm. captain, find Bob the guard yeah. who was on duty there. He's a member of the Thieves' Guild. But, GM, but the GM could have done that, yeah, and that could have been foreshad accidental foreshadowing. Where he could have not admitted to me that he didn't do that, but mm -hmm. just had exactly his planned, and then later had Bob maybe even be a recurring antagonist mm -hmm. who was higher level that we had to deal with, yeah. who, or who joined up with other enemies. When, thing, when things line up well, and your players catch that, then uh, there's no reason not to run with it. Or just like the whole idea that if the players have a theory that's cooler than what you were thinking of, then it's fun to sometimes make that be what the situation actually is. Right. Um, that's yes. Th that's, Bob, a, that's Bob the guard. That's one Bob the guard. There's yes. another Bob the guard in Kingmaker who just had bad Bob world save. But Bob the guard in Shackled City. Don't name your guards Bob unless you want your players to fixate on them. That's Bob, kind of the Bob the guard in Shackled City was Alkyony or Grandier's nemesis. Mm -hmm. Um, who was not really a nemesis because he never showed up again, mm -hmm. but. <laughs> if you give your character the name Bob to indicate that they're not important, then you, and they're just a random guard because you didn't bother to name them beforehand, then they'll become important. Are they all related? Hmm. So there'd be some interesting multi-dimensional stuff going on. I remember there was once three guards in a campaign that were like Bob, Rob, and Bobbert. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe those were all related. Perhaps. Um, in, in any case, Bob's uh, and guards aside, um, mm -hmm. the point is that sometimes foreshadowing can be retro shattering, shadowing, yeah. um, and that is perfectly fine because whatever connection your players actually make, um, they're going to be satisfied, and they might not be exactly right in the thing that they thought about all along that you didn't even think of. You can make it slightly different, but they'll be satisfied. That I figured it out even if I wasn't exactly correct oh another one from oh you can also sometimes have pcs discovering your mistakes turn into clues does that guard have a fork in his hat what no because i forgot aha that's the session because he <laughs> didn't have a wood fork for his costumes hat oh uh sure yes yeah, smartly spotted yep so the world as the as the pcs ex explore it as mm -hmm. we've talked about in many episodes you are there sort of the lens through which they view everything yes. that is in the universe and until you have conclusively determined something for the for the for the pcs and they definitively know it then it's squidgy and yep. it can change and because of that if they've gotten a different sense of what's going on um that means that you can change what's going on oh mm -hmm. take care dennis have, have fun at your pfs meeting so um that's sort of uh, that's sort of how to deal with prophecies, long term foreshadowing, and uh, and connections. Mm -hmm. um, Linda, do you have anything else? Uh, well, we definitely want to talk about notes. Yes, the role of notes and yes. players who take notes and and notes. Yeah, in we the, need to do that. And notes in the game, like the letters in the game, they're like ah yes, and I have written and this is it outlines my entire villainous plan. Please read it. Wow, right. We, we said we were going to talk about notes. Yes. That notes in world. That's yes. right. That's notes right. Notes in world, yes. So, you asked me to wait till later. You're right. So, before we go into players taking notes, which is also a good topic, let's mm -hmm. talk about in world notes. I think players taking notes will fit well in our collaborative play topic that's you're right. coming up. 
So let's, so let's, let's talk about in-world in notes, because we said we would at the beginning of the yes. episode, and I blanked on it because I didn't remember the foreshadowing from earlier uh, on. Okay, so even published adventures, or perhaps mostly published adventures, mm -hmm. overuse the idea of, like, this evil person is going to write down secret, who is this, possibly even a spy, will write down secret sensitive information in a Dear Diary approach, mm -hmm. because they need to get the exposition to the PCs. And this strange disbelief to the point that it just cracks into a million pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very challenging to not use it, on the other hand, because um, in a published adventure, you don't know what the players are going to do, but they're probably not going to burn down the building that has the notebook in it. Yeah, you don't know um, who exactly You know they're going to loot talking. everything, yes. but you don't know anything else. Whereas in a home game, um, like I usually get just get rid of those, Mm -hmm. And find a find a different way by improvising with what my PCs do to get whatever that information was, mm -hmm. because it's just it, I know it would aggravate them if mm -hmm. this master spy just left a written record of something. So um, there there could be heavily encrypted notes in a secret place, such as on the spy themselves, where they wouldn't possibly go elsewhere. So if you do have if you do have to have notes, but it should be, but in that case you'd want them to be something that there's a reason why they have to keep this, as opposed to sort of the uh, the old joke of the note that says burn this when you find it, and like they totally didn't burn it. Right. Um, so in encryption and secrecy in the location can help with that suspension of disbelief. There's also um, ways to uh, also one of the most common ways is giving that information to different NPCs that the PCs might talk to. Uh, if your campaign has divinatory type effects, such as if you have someone who has object reading or someone who has divination magic, that can be a good way to go about it. An investigator, um, an investigator from the playtest yes. for second edition mm -hmm. is great because Clues they throughout the location. They have a special ability. Sometimes the uh, was it the empiricist that mm -hmm. they just they find a clue when yeah. they come in. So. so like as opposed to having someone write a notebook where they talk about like, ah yes and I'm going to summon large numbers of devils to take over everything yada yada yada. Then if the PCs find the you know they can find a summoning circle and they can discover that that's clue to hell and hidden somewhere in the building they find the research notes where this person found the devil's true name and then they can try to call that devil themselves to ask information or what have you to figure right. out what was going or on. Or even if you want to be more obscure than that, the PCs mm -hmm. can find... You can decide what the PCs are going to find and you can make the DC easy enough that they can do this. They find residues that then their alchemist determines, mm -hmm. um, oh, these are these five ingredients and then their... Um, person with religion determines that's what's necessary to summon an ocelooth mm -hmm. and this is what an ocelooth is yeah. rather than a, a note that says dear diary today mm -hmm. i thought about how much i love hell and want to summon <laughs> an ocelooth <laughs> oh diary the ocelooth has a long pointy stinger and can turn invisible because they are the inquisitors of hell <laughs> and i really wish to summon them and if i do i will have an ocelooth friend I once have I no have, other friends. Once I have an Ocelooth friend, I have decided what I'm going to do with my Ocelooth friend. Allow me to write it out in a nine-step list. I will secretly attack the Order of the Radiant Sun. They have always no, they have always mocked me, and as long as they don't know about the Ocelooth coming, it will surely spell their demise. That is why I'm only telling you, Diary. You've always kept my confidences, even when... The former acolytes, when I was used to be trying to be part of that order, gave away the fact that I was doing devil rituals on the side. But Diary, you're the only one I can trust. Diary, I hope no one ever finds the <laughs> hidden magic scepter that's the key to my power that I have hidden in the lock, in the locked case that is in the basement behind a three-part lock. And I've given the three keys to my minions, this person who is in this location, this yeah. person who's in this location, and this person who's in this location. There's also a combination that you can use to bypass having the keys, which is number, the number is 4792. Mm -hmm. Also, I need <laughs> to remember that the password to my other base is Lotus. Anyway. Um, uh, HDWS Live, talking about the Bond villain plan reveal. That's yeah. okay because of the fact mm -hmm. that they think they're going to kill you and they tell you, but just writing it in their diary or, or is has a different one, like, thing. Things with a Batman, a villain with a Batman style villain with obsessions. Like the Shadow Lord can't help themselves. They insist in writing down all their secrets backwards in a blend of draconic and fiendish. It can be a fun quirk and detail, but you can't do it often. Unless you make one of the main villains the cult of the god and evil scribes who are required to write everything down. 
<laughs> I love that. Anyway. But here's the one that really gets me. There are published adventures where um, there are people who worship Norgorber, the god mm-hmm. who is basically the opposite of what Owen said, who is, is a secrecy and would be required not to write it down or mm-hmm. to destroy books that have it, and they still keep diaries. Yeah. And th- um, that is where... That is where the adventure does it because if you're a starting GM and you're not mm-hmm. watching like videos about GM tools and you're just starting off, and your group also just the amount they groan at this may be zero because they yeah. don't notice, but it may it was smaller than the problem of how are you going to put this information in, and, and, and it is the easiest way to get the information. Yeah. And in. I would say that I would say that in an adventure, in a published adventure that has that kind of letter, if you're running like an adventure path, that letter is an excellent place to look at for here's the inform hi GM. Here's the information that would be great to get into the hands of your players in an easy-to-digest format. Yes, Stump Monkey talks about the Watchmen Ultimate Reveal. You can't stop it. My plan happened 30 minutes ago, but that you need to be careful about. That's definitely the first campaign led to play it in, mm-hmm. although the PC subverted it by coming even earlier, earlier, yeah. which was that the villain had a ritual that was known to take one day on a plane where a day equals one year. <laughs> so the PCs were like, oh, we have a year, and then we'll go on to that plane. But they actually came in fairly early, and the villain revealed that actually the final one-third of the ritual was repetitive chanting that didn't do anything, Mm -hmm. so that, um, because he knows that heroes figure out your plan and then come at the last minute to try to stop him, and at that point it would have been too late. Yeah. But they came in slightly before that. But, um, so, but semi-disloyal, like, second or thirds in command who have secrets and want to not be killed or will decide that they, or... People who are becoming increasingly frustrated with the boss and decide that they would rather that they need to they've gone too far and they need to be taken down. These sorts of characters are great sources of information. These inside people who are willing to speak to the PCs. Right. And Owen says you can have a diary that says, I did not poison the Duke of Dinner last night with Nightshade for the Guild of Miners. Mm-hmm. And yes, you can also have fake diaries that um that's just talking about not um saying things that are not exactly mm-hmm. correct, but you can you can have th- one that's just planted as mm-hmm. as evidence to try to throw off someone who found yeah. it. But like that's it, a little... Like an, yeah, like an NPC, in a, uh, an NPC in a campaign that I am playing with you who uh, basically had a diary that's like, Dear Diary, how much do I love following the rules? Following the rules is the best. Also, I give lots to charity. It essentially like that. They're just like patron. It was a hidden diary yeah. of a NPC who liked to steal from everybody yeah. and like completely violate lots of rules mm-hmm. and she had hidden in a very hard to find place a diary about how she loves the rules and wants to no she was at a school and yeah. she was talking about the giving to the charity of like to help the teachers oh, yeah. to help the teachers have higher salaries yeah, yeah. she likes the school rules so much yeah <laughs> yep yep so yeah you can certainly have uh hidden ones uh, do what you, uh, Stephen Zucker says, do what I do. I give my PCs diaries that are completely the opposite of what they're doing. You can do that, but as we mentioned with foreshadowing, and I even said something mm-hmm. similar just before this, the problem, same problem with foreshadowing where your players will forget it if, if it's if it's not obvious enough unless you have just the right players, mm-hmm. is a problem when you give them opposite information, even if when you originally give it to them from a source mm-hmm. that they shouldn't trust or that is known to be untrustworthy, there's a pretty, if it's very direct, there's a pretty high chance they'll remember later the thing that was wrong and forget about mm-hmm. the fact that it was from a source they shouldn't trust. In fact, not only does that happen to people who are playing a role-playing game, mm-hmm. unfortunately, that happens to all of us every day. Mm-hmm. When you get a piece of information from somewhere that you know is not to trust, mm-hmm. you will likely remember it later and forget quite as much that it was something that you shouldn't trust they've done like um, yeah. psychological studies like that some you will, random news source that gets linked on facebook that's completely that's, unreliable right and so at first they've done a study where at first the people read things that were and they knew it was from an unreliable source so they were like this i relate really unreliable and then mm-hmm. like a few months later they asked them about the same fact and they rated it higher because yeah. they had forgotten it was from an unreliable and untrustworthy source yeah so in the example, and then uh, the point here from HGWS Live, the other long-term problems you risk conditioning players just to not trust the information you give them, whether the source is trustworthy in-universe or not. Exactly. So in the, in the case of this diary, it was funny because my character already very much knew this character was a thief when she found that diary and then was like, oh, ha-ha, I see what she's trying to pull. 
But I already had the facts in place, so it wasn't necessarily it wasn't necessarily misleading. Because an NPC hired uh, sort of hired Linda's character to spy on this character. Uh, after that character hired Linda's character to trick the NPC into hiring her to spy on mm -hmm. her. Yes. Yes. It was convoluted. It was complicated. Then you give them a hundred percent trustworthy source. So so yeah. I that's mean, what that's what Stephen Gugger was saying. He then gives them a trustworthy source that they don't trust. Uh, so when you do that, it needs to it needs to not feel cheap. That mm -hmm. um, some of these are, there there should be signs or clues that there that that this information mm -hmm. might not be the thing that they should trust the most when they first receive it. Um, like if they it, find it from if a there, super shady information broker, or if there's things that so seem, then they that, later find is actually a member of the organization that they were giving information about and was trying to screw them over. If there's information that seems equally trustworthy and just sometimes it's completely a screw over and sometimes mm -hmm. it's it's completely trustworthy and there's no way to tell. Um, the, like the real world has, mm -hmm. has situations like that, but for players they can get frustrated by it, whereas. Mm -hmm. At least if there were clues afterwards to know whether which one was more trustworthy or not, that can help. Or, for example, the PCs gather information around, and one way to figure out that that's going on is that the PCs are gathering information in general, and they find contradictory information. Right. And then they're trying to figure out which of these sources Which one is that. right. And then they're going to investigate more, and then they might find out, oh, wait, the, everything from this person is, like contradicting with these things from these other people let's figure out who's who's not telling the right. truth here oh wait this person and the specific. scale the scale of what yeah. you can do depends on your players like steven's uh clicker what he says here that could work for some groups where yeah. they know that's going on and they love sifting through what's true and what's not mm -hmm. and using logic to figure it out a typical group might not be able to handle that they might already be in the point where you're if you give them fully true foreshadowing they still mm -hmm. don't really remember it so you really have to understand your group before you decide what what is going to work for them, uh, and that's how you and can get the best foreshadowing. And that's what I was talking about, giving short to medium term foreshadowing early in and the see game how to it give pays a sense off. of how they how it pays off and what they're picking up on. Right. And if they're and if they don't pick up on much, then just go with a few long. Then you can just go with a few long term points that you keep hammering home over and over again. And that aren't and fake. The, that aren't fake. And then the and then the scattershot approach to pick up on things that they like throughout, even if they don't necessarily notice those lines. Of, excuse me, those lines of continuity most of the time. The few times that they do pick them up, it's like, yep. So there we go. That's about notes mm -hmm. and um, and the overuse of notes. And we'll continue to overuse notes in published adventures because, like we said, they're the mm -hmm. training wheels of how to make sure information gets I to the PCs. Whatever your players have tried in the previous five game sessions to figure things out, they'll likely try it again. So if they have a routine, you can just plant clues directly on the path of what they do every time. I mean, that's one of the techniques. Um, knowing the player's general routine is one of the techniques I use to 90% or more predict, at least in broad strokes, mm -hmm. the path that they're going to take in a, in, a, um, in a sandbox. Because characters, once, once they've played through a dozen adventures, you know, they're going to they're gonna stick to their same models. They're going to keep doing the things that work for them. Characters and players have, yes. they have routines and um, just tendencies that you can analyze and figure out. Mm-hmm. But not every GM can do that. Like and if, if you, a player if, if, always played, likes casting divination spells, whatever their character is, they're always like sneaking into areas and doing other stuff. And if you can't figure that out, that's fine, and mm -hmm. you don't have to. But yeah. if you can, then like Owen says, it can make it easier mm -hmm. to do this. Yeah. All right. So um, I think that's all of our topics mm -hmm. for today. And I've got we've got our War for the Crown game in yeah. about forty five minutes. So we should. But let's say bye, here. let's say bye to YouTube and then do a little bit more with Twitch. Sounds so good. Bye, bye YouTube. YouTube. See you next time.